Magnus Erlinson, shared the earldom of Orkney with his cousin Hakon in the early 1100s. Following a dispute, Hakon had Magnus killed. Magnus's nephew Ronald came from Norway to claim his uncle's earldom and promised the people of Orkney he would build a great stone minster in honour of Magnus and create a place of pilgrimage. As you will see, there is no doubt that he kept his promise. Let's hear Fran Hollenreich, custodian of the cathedral today, describe just how differently the cathedral would have looked in its medieval glory. Um, well, the cathedral was started in the, the early 12th century, we think about 1137, and clearly it was supposed to be a massive visual statement. Um, the two main stones that are used are red sandstone and yellow sandstone, and they both come from quarries very near to here, so they're, they're local stone. But it was, you know, obviously supposed to be a really eye-popping kind of statement, you know, um, to use red and yellow stone. But they also used a lot of the kind of rougher grey stone. And anywhere you see that, it's very likely that would have been plastered and painted. And in a building that's Romanesque with really little windows, everything inside would have had to be really bright, really, to see anything. So the, the walls would have been probably white, there would have been paintings on the walls, there would have been statues, there would have been tapestries, you know, it would have been an absolute riot of colour because you weren't relying on electric light to light anything up, you know, you would just have had torches, maybe or lanterns. Um, so yeah, when we see it now with this kind of rough stone, um, it's hard to imagine it really brightly coloured and decorated and gilding and, and pictures and, and statues and things, but that's what it would have been like. Um, the way it looks now is really a product of the early 20th century. Um, there was lots of treatments over the years. There was the Reformation, there was the occupation by Cromwell's troops. But the biggest makeover the cathedral had was the early 20th century. Um, and the way you see it now with the fixtures and fittings, the floors and the stained glass windows and the wooden screens and the organ, all of that dates from 1913 to 1930. Um, and that's when they basically scoured the walls back, to, stripped it back to the bare stone. So the way it looks now is not the way it would have looked in, in the Middle Ages. Um, certainly not in its kind of medieval glory. It would have been a, you know, absolute, you know, would have looked completely different to the way it is now. But, you know, maybe in a hundred years time they'll change their minds and, I don't know, paint the walls again, who knows? Imagination of the amazing colour described by Fran continues today in the work of artist Russell Gilmer, who dedicates so much of his time to capturing the essence of the cathedral in his paintings. Let's hear from Fran again. Arches in the windows. All the glass that's in the cathedral at the moment is very modern. It, the, the oldest bit of glass we have is from the 1880s. Most of what you see dates from the 1910s, 1920s. But the window arches themselves. Again, it's very difficult to be specific, but there's some indication that the surround of a window, the actual thing that it's set into, might have symbolism, might have significance. For example, and I have no, I've never done a big analysis of this, so somebody else can go and do this if they like. But if you have, um, for example, a cathedral or a church uh, that's dedicated to a, a male saint, you quite often find that the pillars, either in the, the structure or the statue niches or the windows, that the pillars are the, the Doric pillars. So in your classical column orders, you've got Doric, Ionic and, and Corinthian. And quite often a Doric column is an indication of a male saint or a, a male presence of some kind. If you see an Ionic column, which is the one with the, looks like it's got the eyes at the top of it, those kind of little scrolly things, yep, yep. Uh, that's quite often associate, associate, associated with female saints or the feminine, some kind, and you sometimes see that on gravestones, you'll see the kind of columns of it's a woman. And if you see the Corinthian columns, which are the ones with the acanthus leaves, that was reserved exclusively for windows or statues of the Virgin Mary. So you can sometimes tell by looking at a window or a statue niche if there was a statue or a window depicting the Virgin Mary. So, I mean, I'm sure it's not 100% in every single case, but it's, sometimes you get these little clues 
to the kind of medieval past through those sorts of things. The grandeur continues in the stunning architecture in the windows described by Fran. From the pulpit up into the vaulted ceiling and arches. along the magnificent aisles and intricate woodwork. And we come to the sleeping man, Dr John Ray, Arctic explorer who found the final stretch of the Northwest Passage and who is buried in the kirkyard. The panels depicting the story of the cathedral were presented by the children of Arran. The rings used by Cromwell's men to tether their horses. The bell raised from the wreck of the Royal Oak and the Book of Remembrance for those who died. The font decorated with polished stones collected by children from every parish on Orkney. The Templar-like cross, perhaps a pilgrim mark or a mark of dedication as it lies on one of the oldest walls, no one really knows. Pilgrims over the years have left their marks and the 21st century pilgrims are no exception. Following the newly established St Magnus Way, they can complete their journey in the cathedral and be awarded their stamp of completion. The colour of the cathedral continues today with its sunlit reflections and the lighting of the cathedral in the colours of Ukraine, a symbol of the love Arcadians have for those in need. <laughs>